Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. Hear now the word of God. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. May God bless the reading of his word to us. And now let's look at Lord's Day 16. I will read the question. Let us give the answer together. Lord's Day 16 beginning with question 40. Why did Christ have to suffer death? Answer, because God's justice and truth require it. Nothing else could pay for our sins except the death of the Son of God. Question 41, why was he buried? Answer, his burial testifies that he really died. Question 42, since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? Answer, Our death is not a payment for our sins, but only a dying to sins and an entering into eternal life. Question 43, what further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Answer, by his power, our old man is crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may offer ourselves as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him. Question 44, why does the creed add he descended into hell? Answer, to assure me during tax of deepest dread and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. All right, so last week we looked at the sufferings of Christ in Lord's Day 15. We saw that he suffered during his whole life as he maintained perfect passive obedience. Remember, passive is not that he lets things come to him. It means passive in his suffering, his passio, the Latin word for suffering, So in his obedience unto suffering, he is perfect, and also his active obedience is perfect on our behalf. 
So his whole life is marked by suffering, but especially the end of his life. And we looked at the importance of the phrase in the creed that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. This roots the Christian faith in history. It prevents Christianity from being reduced to mere morality. So if the historical events of Christianity can be proven untrue, everything is lost. <clears throat> so Christianity is unique in that everything depends upon actual historical events. And today we look at the death of Christ itself. So question 40, why did he have to suffer death? Because God's justice and truth require it. Nothing else could pay for our sins except the death of the Son of God. Now we confess in Reformed theology that Christ hold three, holds three offices. He is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. And we don't want to get to where we're segmenting these offices out as if Jesus is changing hats in the middle of a sentence, now I'm acting as priest, now I'm acting as king. But we can distinguish, to some degree, his activities in particular offices. And his death specifically highlights his priestly office. And we see that in the Catechism. The office of priest goes all the way back to the garden. Adam was to act as prophet, priest, and king, the first Adam. And of course, he foreshadows Christ in each of these offices. And in his priestly office, we see that God places Adam in the garden, Genesis 2.15, to work it and keep it. This is priestly language that we see later in the Old Testament reserved for the Levitical priests. One of the duties of the priests was to take care of God's temple, to work and keep, maintain the temple. And of course, prior to the fall into sin, the whole Garden of Eden was God's temple, a special place where he would meet with man, and Adam was to work and keep this garden, this temple of God. Now, of course, Adam fails in his office as priest, but the priesthood nevertheless continues even after the fall. So we see the priesthood of Melchizedek, Genesis 14. He is a priest forever, as Christ will be. He's a type of Christ. He foreshadows Christ. We also see Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Job, other, others of the patriarchs carry on priestly functions. They make sacrifices unto God. The Levitical priesthood then is established in Exodus 28, verse 1. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar. So the priest is chosen by God. He's set apart for this office, and he stands between God and the people. This is the priestly function. To God, he represents the people. To the people, he represents, God's. he represents God. He acts as the mediator. And of course, one of the primary functions of the priest, the Levitical priesthood, is to make sacrifices. You have daily sacrifices, morning and evening. A lamb is offered as a burnt offering. You have flour as a grain offering and wine as a drink offering. So every day, morning and evening, offerings. Then on the Sabbath, you double what you do during the week. So two lambs offered as a burnt offering, double flour, double wine for their offerings. Then monthly, two bulls, one ram, seven lambs are offered in addition to the flour and the wine as grain offerings and drink offerings. Daily, weekly, monthly, and then five times throughout the year, you have the feasts. With these feasts come prescribed sacrifices. It's constant death and blood. A priest would have felt at home in a slaughterhouse because much of his duty was to sacrifice animals. These were men experienced with death and blood. And why is that? Why so much blood? As we read in Hebrews 9, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness only comes through sacrifice. 
It only comes through death. What did God do after Adam and Eve sinned? The first sin in the garden. Genesis 3, verse 21. The Lord made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Where'd the skin come from? Is this faux leather? Genuine leatheroid? No, God killed an animal. Something had to die to cover them. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. From the very beginning, we see that is God's standard. Why does he accept Abel's offering and not Cain's offering? Cain brings produce, fruits and vegetables. Abel brings the firstborn of his flock. Animal sacrifice, blood is shed. That's why Abel is approved and Cain is not. It requires blood. Over and over with the patriarchs offering sacrifices, the Levitical priests offering their sacrifices, thousands and thousands and thousands of animals are slaughtered over the centuries. And despite all this, despite all of this blood and death, there was no permanent satisfaction for sin. This had to continue until the great high priest appears, the one to whom all the sacrifices pointed. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 9, Christ appears as high priest of the good things that have come through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. So he is the perfect sacrifice. Only he can secure permanent redemption. We see in Hebrews 7, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So the Levitical priest, not only is he offering up sacrifices for the people, he's offering up sacrifices for himself. But Christ doesn't have to do that. He is the perfect sacrifice. Not only does he, need, does he not need a sacrifice for himself, but his sacrifice is permanent. He offers up the sacrifice of himself on behalf of his people, a permanent satisfaction for sins. And it has to be this way. There is no other way of redemption. Because, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. God told Adam and Eve, on the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. This is the penalty for sin. God's justice demands the ultimate penalty. So we confess in Heidelberg 11, his justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. That's what God requires as the sacrifice. And of course, we could never pay that price, so our great high priest pays it for us. Question 41, why was he buried? His burial testifies that he really died. We see accounts of Christ's burial in the Gospels, in Luke, in Matthew, in John. I'll read the account in Matthew, Matthew 27, verse 59. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. He rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. So Christ dies, he's buried. And when we discussed the humanity of Christ a few weeks back, I mentioned the heresy of docetism. This is the idea that Jesus only appeared to be human. He wasn't actually human, he just appeared that way, he seemed that way. And so related to this is that Jesus didn't actually die. If he wasn't really human, he didn't actually die, or even groups who think that he was human, they claim that he didn't actually die. Islam testifies to this about the death of Christ. In Surah 4157, 
It says, and for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following assumption, and they did not kill him for certain. So according to Islam, Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Simon the Cyrene is crucified in his place, and the eyewitnesses were confused, deceived, and they thought that Jesus actually died. But his burial refutes these lies of docetism and Islam, any other false teaching that claimed that Jesus didn't die. He actually died, and he was buried. His burial was prophesied, Isaiah 53. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Matthew 12, Jesus predicts his own death and burial. So if he didn't actually die, if he traded places with Simon the Cyrene, why would he prophesy his own death and burial? Doesn't seem very consistent. Matthew 12, he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was really dead. He didn't trade places. He didn't just appear to be dead. Related to this is the swoon theory of the death of Christ. You might have heard this, that he didn't actually die. He swooned on the cross, appeared to be dead. They thought he was dead. They took him into the tomb. The cold air of the tomb woke him up and revived him. And then somehow he pushes this multi-ton rock out of the way. It's so much easier to believe in the miracle than to come up with these fanciful explanations. He actually died. He actually was buried. And those who took him from the cross, those who prepared his body with the linens and the spices, they prepare it just as they would any other dead body. He was actually dead. And this proves, his burial does, that he really died. Now, he knew, of course, that the tomb would not be his final resting place. He had foreordained the resurrection, and his ultimate home was elsewhere. We see a foreshadow of this in the burial of Abraham in Genesis 25. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. Why is Moses, when he's recording this, so particular about where this tomb is? Because it's in the promised land. Abraham's buried in the promised land. Long before Israel takes possession of that, Abraham is buried in anticipation that his very own descendants would take that land for themselves, which, of course, was merely a foreshadow of Abraham's ultimate home in heaven. Hebrews 11, by faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundation, whose designer and builder is God. So Abraham knew, ultimately, he would reside in the true promised land of heaven. Joseph, Abraham's great-grandson, makes similar arrangement for his burial in the promised land, Genesis 50. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So, of course, in the Exodus, as the Hebrews leave Egypt, they take Joseph's bones with them, and they bury them in the land of promise. He didn't want his remains to be in the land of Egypt, the land of the enemies of God. He wanted his body to be buried in the promised land. But again, Joseph knew this wasn't all that there is. It wasn't a permanent home. They foreshadowed the resurrection on the last day. So Christ is buried to testify that he really dies. Then, question 42, since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? Our death is not a payment for our sins, but only a dying to sins and an entering unto eternal life. So Christ's death doesn't eliminate the reality of our own death. We still will die. 
even though Christ has died and has been raised again. Christian science denies this reality of our own death. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian science, says, There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind, and it's infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. She goes on. Here also is found the pith of the basal statement, the cardinal point in Christian science that matter and evil, including all in harmony, sin, disease, and death, are unreal. Man is incapable of sin, sickness, and death. So death is just an illusion. You can hear echoes of the ancient heresies of Gnosticism, along with it, Docetism. We only appear to die. We don't actually die. The material world only appears to be real. It's not actually real. And according to Christian science, the spiritual continues on, continues on doing what it's always, it always has done. So you're your matter dies, passes away, and then your spirit continues on. So there is no heaven and hell as actual physical locations. They're merely a state of mind. Everything is the mind. And Mary Baker Eddy actually popularized the term passed away as a substitute for death. The, the term was in use in the English language, but she basically adopted it for herself, passed away, because your material body is merely passing away. Your spirit continues on in its current state. Should we say passed away? Why do we say it? I've said it. If you say it, why do we say it? It seems not as harsh as saying so and so died it seems a little bit softer to say this person passed away. But death is harsh. And it should bother us to say that someone has died. It should be harsh. And when we say that, first it should remind us of our own mortality. This person has died. I too will die one day. But also, the harshness of even saying it reminds us that death is not right. It should be harsh for us to say this, because this is a foreign element that has entered into God's perfect creation, and it should not be. It should be uncomfortable to talk about death. We should be uncomfortable with it. Our death is the pathway to glorification. As the Catechism says, our death is not a payment for our sins, but only a dying to sins and an entering into eternal life. If we didn't die, if we just lived continuously, we would have to wait until the return of Christ to be glorified. Think about that. Can you imagine having to deal with your sin for that long? Think about Abraham. Abraham would be like 4,000 years old. How many sins would he have committed? How sick of sin would he be? Just kill me now and take me to heaven. I'm tired of this. It's actually a blessing to us that we die and enter into the presence of God and we're glorified. So much better, even though death, of course, is unpleasant. It's so much better to die and enter into eternal life than to live with sin continually until Christ returns. The struggle with sin is over then at death. And it is our pathway into eternal life, free from sin forever. Question 43, what further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? 
by his power, our old man is crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may offer ourselves as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him. Paul speaks of this blessing being united to Christ in Romans 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So in Christ's death, as we are united to him, our old man is put to death, crucified with Christ, it's buried with him, and Christ raises us to new life in him as we're united to him. So that is the benefit to us of Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross. Of course, this dying and raising as we're united to Christ, that is signified and sealed in our baptism. Reformed theology does a very good job of stressing the washing aspect of baptism, washing away sin. We do a very good job. That has been uh, emphasized over and over. But we might tend to overlook the aspect of dying and raising to life in baptism. That is signified and sealed in our baptism. Baptism is death and resurrection. We die to Christ. The old man is put to death. We're raised with Christ, and we receive new life. So the Westminster Larger Catechism says, among the blessings of baptism is that it signifies and seals our resurrection unto everlasting life. So the next time you witness a baptism, think about that death and resurrection that we have united to Christ. The Catechism says, Christ has put to death our old man so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us. So no longer are we enslaved to sin. We're not ruled by our evil desires. Does this mean we won't struggle with sin? Struggle with these evil desires? Of course not. The only way out of this struggle is our own death or the return of Christ. So we will still struggle with sin, but we're not enslaved to it. We can overcome it by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. It no longer rules over us. And so instead of that slavery to sin that we once experienced, now we offer ourselves, the Catechism says, as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him. Referencing Paul in Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we're now slaves to Christ. We offer him everything of ourselves as part of our worship of him. And then finally, question 44. Why does the creed add, he descended into hell? To assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. Now, contrary to what some say, Christ's descent into hell is not literal. He didn't go to a specific location in his spirit after his death to suffer. There are many strange teachings related to the time after his death on the cross and his resurrection. Um, Pentecostals, charismatics of various forms have some very fanciful explanations of what happens during that time. Some think that he went to hell and continued to suffer at the hands of Satan. Others say he went to hell to confront Satan, to do battle with him. 
But what did he say on the cross? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So where did he go after he died? He went to be with the Father. He didn't go to hell, either to suffer or to battle Satan. He went to be with the Father. So any other explanation is just inserting man's ideas into the text of Scripture. And his descent into hell just means that he suffered all the torments of hell on the cross. That's what we confess in the creed. This answer 44 is just another one of the many comforting aspects of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, from the very beginning, question one, we see the warmth of the Heidelberg and its comfort. And even in this, this doctrine, this article of the creed that on the surface you wouldn't think would bring comfort, <laughs> he descended into hell. You look to that for your comfort? Yes, we do. To assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptation that Christ has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. His descent into hell gives us assurance. When I'm suffering in dread and temptation, I can have assurance and comfort by meditating on Christ's suffering. And ultimately, we know, even in the midst of deepest dread and temptation, that he has delivered us. And so we should see our dread and temptation as a momentary light affliction, reading it through the lens of Christ's suffering on our behalf. And so we can have comfort in life and death because Christ has descended into hell for us, suffering all the torments of hell on our behalf. There's no more hell for us to suffer. He's paid all of it. And so his burial, his descent into the suffering of hell provides us with great assurance and comfort that Christ has accomplished redemption on our behalf. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your marvelous plan of redemption that you have accomplished in Christ. We thank you for the great truths that you revealed to us, the many comforting aspects of the redemption that Christ has procured for us. May you indeed give us assurance, comfort us with the reality that Christ has suffered everything on our behalf. There is nothing left for us to suffer. He has borne it all. Give us great confidence and hope in his suffering, but especially in his resurrection, that if Christ has been raised, indeed we will be raised on the last day. In the name of our great Savior, we pray. Amen. Please rise to receive the Lord's benediction. Following the benediction, I will pray for our meal together, and then we will partake. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.